Hello. You're listening to Late Edition Crime Beat Chronicles, a product of Lee Enterprises. My name is Chris Lay, and I'm the podcast operations manager for Lee. With Late Edition Crime Beat Chronicles, we're presenting notable true crime stories as reported by journalists for the dozens of various Lee Enterprises-owned publications from around America. For this first series, we're taking a short drive east of Tulsa, Oklahoma, to learn more about the state's most notorious cold case, the 1977 slaying of three Girl Scouts. The episode you're about to hear is the fifth in a six-part series, so if this is your entry to the show, head on back to episode one and start from the beginning. What you'll hear first is audio from the series of articles written and read by Tulsa World journalist Tim Stanley, published in 2017 to mark the 40th anniversary of the tragedy. After that, you'll hear a conversation between myself and Tim that expands on the story and explores his experiences reporting the series so many decades after the initial crime. It might go without saying, but given the subject matter here and every story that we're going to document going forward, there are some obvious content warnings to impart. While everything here would be fit to print in a newspaper, parents are still cautioned to give the episode a listen before sharing this with any youngsters. For now, though, here's Tim reading Chapter 5, which is titled, Trying to Find Good. Please water her African violets. It had been one of Michelle Gousset's farewell instructions for her family before she left for Girl Scout camp. They promised her they would, and that promise would be kept, even after they knew she was not coming back. Unlike the purple flowers, though, which became a way to keep Michelle's memory alive, what Richard Gousset discovered growing in his heart in the months afterward was not beautiful, and, he decided, it needed to be rooted out. I was bitter and angry at the time of my daughter's murder, he told the Tulsa World in a previous interview. It's an easy thing to do, hate, and that will consume you. I decided something has to come from this, from her life. That something began to take shape in 1980, three years after the deaths of Denise Milner, Lori Farmer, and Michelle Gousset, as Gousset threw himself into victims' rights efforts in Oklahoma. Becoming a leading voice and volunteer, he told Michelle's and his family's story again and again, pushing for passage of the Crime Victims' Witness Bill of Rights, a package of laws adopted by the state legislature. Praised by the bill's sponsors as their number one lobbyist, Gousset from there was appointed by the governor to the Crime Victims' Compensation Board, which was created in that effort. This is my commitment to our situation, Gousset said in 1994, after 13 years of never missing a board meeting. Because of my daughter, maybe the world will be a little better place to be. Hopefully, some good is coming out of this. In the immediate aftermath of a tragedy, finding some good in it is a tall order. With this story, even after 40 years, the picture is still complicated, the memories painful. Among those connected to the case, that's certainly true for the Girl Scouts. Lauren Zeligson, spokeswoman for what is now Girl Scouts of Eastern Oklahoma, said the murders marked a point in our history of unspeakable pain for the families, girls, our council, its supporters, and surrounding community. Our hearts continue to go out to the families and Girl Scouts that were lost. For four years after the crimes, with Camp Scott's closure, Tulsa area Girl Scouts had no summer camp. Then, land was acquired in Osage County, and Camp Tall Chief was established. Surrounded by a large fence, Tall Chief introduced cabins rather than tents for scouts to sleep in. Security measures were also heightened. With other improvements made through the years, including most recently, new cabins, Tall Chief continues to be everything we thought it would be and more, Z. Lucen said. Not only does it reflect that the safety of our girls is our highest priority, but it offers better opportunities for our girls to engage in outdoor experiences that are the hallmark of our summer camp program. As the organization tried to find its way forward after the murders, it also had to weather criticism. The farmers and milliners filed civil lawsuits against the Magic Council, claiming its negligence was partly responsible for the deaths of their daughters. In 1985, the case was brought to trial, 
the plaintiff seeking a total judgment of $5 million. Testimony from former campers and counselors included claims of thefts and strange happenings in the days leading up to camp and on the night of the crimes, screams heard in the night, and sightings of a strange man. But in the end, the jury ruled in favor of the counsel. Two years later, the decision was upheld by the state appeals court. In interviews over the years, Sherry Farmer has remained critical of the organization, particularly for the way she says it closed ranks, treating her as an adversary rather than a grieving parent as she tried to get information. Today, Farmer says her anger has softened, but she adds that she's still resentful. In later interviews, the organization conceded that in the interests of the girls it served, it had wanted to protect its image. Plenty spoke up for the organization too, however. One of the campers at Camp Scott in 1977, Amy Sullivan is now a college history professor in St. Paul, Minnesota, and wrote her master's thesis on how the Tulsa Council preserved outdoor programs for girls after the murders. They saved camping for us, the former Tulsan said. They saved that experience for girls here. My place in this story is as someone who has loved the Girl Scouts, who stayed in the Girl Scouts. For Dick Wilkerson and others on the investigative side, the Girl Scout murders case remains the one that taught them the good guys don't always win. We had the Lord on our side, we were right, and I thought that was all that was needed said the former Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation Deputy Director. Stunned at the time by the verdict, years later he came to understand it better, he said, noticing what he believes are parallels with the O.J. Simpson case. It was a situation where people could not believe that somebody who they thought they knew could do something like this, Wilkerson said, adding that he now thinks of the Girl Scout case as the O.J. before O.J., that factor created a general atmosphere, in his opinion, that ultimately influenced the jury. Wilkerson later became a state senator, where the experience was on his mind when he sponsored successful legislation funding a DNA database and upgrading the state's forensic testing capabilities. But 40 years later, he said he still hurts for the investigators, who he says were unfairly maligned. There was no appreciation for what these officers had sacrificed. The worst thing you can say about a career law enforcement officer is to accuse him of corruption or incompetence. To frame hard and fabricate evidence, he said, think what would have been necessary. OHP, OSBI, Mays County Sheriff, Mays County DA, the FBI, all would have had to gotten together. You couldn't get all those people to agree it's daylight outside. Wilkerson's brother Mike Wilkerson was an agent on the case, and together they co-wrote a book that defended the investigation titled Someone Cry for the Children, it was later made into a documentary. I was proud of that investigation, Dick Wilkerson said. Our guys did great work and under adverse circumstances. As for Sheriff Pete Weaver, who suffered a heart attack before the trial, he went on to lose his re-election bid in 1980. In a later interview, Weaver said the case still haunted him. How a man like Gene Leroy Hart could become a folk hero, he added, was something he would never understand. Now in his 80s, Ron Schaefer, too, is still unable to put the case behind him, he said. The pictures of those little girls, such little bitty innocent things to be brutalized like that, the former chief prosecutor said, those are still with me. I guess they always will be. Schaefer, who went on to become a Tulsa County District Judge, said he hasn't changed his mind about the case and believes, in my heart, we had the right man. The prosecution is not allowed to request a change of venue, he said. But if it had been, I think it would have made a hell of a lot of difference. We always said if we'd had it in Tulsa, we'd have gotten a conviction. In Mays County, I think they had their mind made up before they ever got to the trial. Ross Swimmer, who was the Cherokee Nation principal chief at the time of the trial, doubts that opinions among tribal members have changed in 40 years. It was the kind of case, he added, where once people made up their minds, they seemed to be set. I think people who were certain that he was guilty and got justice in jail are still certain, Swimmer said. People that were certain that he was innocent, they probably still are certain. Officially, the Cherokee Nation had no position on the case, but the council did donate $12,500 to Hart's defense, which might at least have created the appearance of taking sides. Swimmer said that was not the case. 
I wish I could remember our exact discussions, he said, but I really don't believe the council had particular feelings one way or the other about Hart's guilt or innocence. The concern was, he said, that with Hart there had been a rush to judgment by the authorities, and so part of the reason for the donation was to see that he had a defense, had his day in court. We were just ensuring that he had a fair trial. I think he did. Moreover, he added, he doesn't believe Hart's identity as a Cherokee created any prejudice in his favor among tribal members in general. I think a lot of Cherokees were sad early on because it appeared a Cherokee had committed this terrible crime, Swimmer said. But I think the more that came out about the investigation, the problems with it, speculation that evidence was planted, it began to turn people around, change their minds. Swimmer was supportive of the two late tribal members, Sam Pigeon and William Lee Smith, who were charged with aiding Hart. Members of a respected traditional religious order, if they helped Hart, he said, they believed they were doing the right thing. The charges against the men were dropped after Hart's acquittal. In the late 1980s, hopes surged that there might finally be answers in the case. DNA testing had just been introduced and was on its way to revolutionizing criminal investigation. In the 30 years since, a number of DNA tests have been conducted on biological evidence from the crime scene. To date, due largely to the deteriorated state of that evidence, authorities say, nothing conclusive has come from them. One test, though, at least gave reason for pause. In 1989, of five aspects of DNA tested from the scene, three reportedly matched those of body fluids taken from heart. Only one in 7,700 American Indians would match the samples of fluids as Hart did, authorities said. But because only three of the five aspects matched, the results were officially deemed inconclusive. The late Jack Graves, then Mays County District Attorney, said if that test result had been available, he would have used it at trial. What it comes down to is, if there were 7,700 North American Indians at the Girl Scout camp on the night of the murders, only one would have matched the gene characteristics of Jean Leroy Hart, he said in a 1989 interview. The chances of that are pretty small. OSBI spokeswoman Jessica Brown said the case is still open. I would not consider it active, she said, but over the years it has become active when we get information to follow. From the beginning, new claims and information have surfaced periodically. Then, Mays County Sheriff Paul Smith announced in the mid-1980s that he was investigating links to possible other suspects. In the end, nothing came of it. So too for claims that Bill Stevens, a convicted rapist, was the killer, a the theory put forward by the Hart defense team. A Kansas inmate, Stevens had been investigated and eliminated as a suspect even before the trial, authorities said. A more recent claim, which is the thrust of an upcoming film about the case, points the finger at convicted murderer Carl Myers. John Russell, an ex-convict who is making the film Candles about the case, says the late Myers confessed to him once while they shared adjacent cells. Russell gave the information to OSBI, which would say only that agents checked out the lead. Myers died in 2013 of natural causes while awaiting execution for the 1996 killing of Cindy Marzano of Broken Arrow. No DNA testing is being done at this time, but future testing remains a possibility. It's amazing how, when I'm speaking, that emotion can come right back, Sherry Farmer said. You wouldn't think so after 40 years. Much like Richard Gousset, Farmer found a constructive way to redirect her grief and anger in the years following the murders. She took up the cause of victims' rights. Over the past four decades, Farmer has met, spoken to, and counseled thousands of people in classes, seminars, and one-on-one, -on -one, including crime victim and law enforcement groups. She said whenever she speaks, she prays going in, Lord, just let these words make a difference. Let them matter in another life. If it existed at all in the late 1970s, crime victims' rights as a movement was an embryonic form. Farmer was in on the first wave, helping lead efforts in Oklahoma. Among the changes she personally pushed for were for victims' families, the right to be in the courtroom and to have a secure waiting area during court proceedings. 
Together with her husband, Farmer also started a Parents of Murdered Children chapter in Oklahoma to mark what would have been Lori's 16th birthday. One thing we can do is we can make a difference in other people's lives, Farmer said. If you have something bad happen, ask yourself, how can this help anybody else? Every now and then, Farmer hears from somebody who's heard her speak. And I think, okay, wow, maybe I did change some things. Something has changed because of that experience, she said. Former Tulsan Cheryl Stokes can speak to just how profoundly that experience has changed some. A childhood friend and schoolmate of Lori Farmer's, Stokes saw the course of her life altered by the murders and their aftermath. Now, she advocates for families at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in Alexandria, Virginia. Every morning at her office, she said, she walks in and sees the three photos on display there, of Lori, Denise, and Michelle, and her sense of mission is renewed. Everyone who walks in sees these three little girls, Stokes said, adding that it's one way she tries to keep their memories alive. She also has books, articles, and photos about the case displayed, along with the Remembering Lori button she wears every May 25th, National Missing Children's Day. In my office, she said, it's all about them. Stokes was eight years old at the time of the crimes. I remember hearing Lori's name over and over and thinking to myself, this can't be our Lori, she said. My heart ached for all the families. From the experience of following the case and the trial, Stokes said she knew when she grew up she was going to be an advocate. I wanted to make sure families would not be alone through one of the most difficult and isolating times in their lives, she said. Just because Stokes is zeroed in on that mission, though, doesn't mean she's forgotten about the status of the case that started it. Again, those three little faces are there in her office as reminders. We will never give up, never, Stokes said, of finding answers for the farmers and the other families. I still believe the murders will be solved. I believe somewhere out there, someone knows something and I hope they realize it is time they came forward. What you just heard was the fifth of six articles written in 2017 by Tim Stanley for the Tulsa World, as read by the author, all of which can be found at tulsaworld.com, presented with incredible new photos alongside images from the newspaper's archives. Links to those and any other relevant content can be found in the show notes. After a short pause, we're going to go to a conversation between myself and Tim Stanley that was recorded just last week. Chapter 5, Trying to Find Good. The first thing that that jumped out, I mean, you start with talking about the Girl Scouts representative, and that's something that we haven't, I think we've, we've addressed indirectly but I mean, it certainly was a was a PR, you know, nightmare for them. O- obviously, that's very small in the larger picture. But what were the the conversations like that you had with the the representatives from the Girl Scouts? I mean, obviously, you know, they were a key part of of the story. So we wanted to uh, certainly include them. I think. You know, what I ended up getting was just it was like a statement from them, which I mean, I, that's not not untypical. So I don't I don't recall I, that we had an actual conversation, uh, at least on the record. Um, they provided a statement. You know, I, I think, yeah, they, they were in a difficult position, no doubt. Um, and probably looking back, I know certainly from the family's standpoint, they could have handled it better. Um, the, the organization, but it was pretty an unprecedented thing that they had dropped into their laps. I mean, just, you know, not anything you could ever, you know, foresee happening. You know, they circled the wagons and, um, you know, in, in my talks with the families, you know, particularly the farmers, um, you know, they, yeah, were really uh, not too happy. Uh, about uh, how the organization uh, worked with them on the front end, frankly, you know, didn't work with them. Like I said, kind of circled the wagons. I'm sure they were 
you know, operating from the advice of, of their attorneys. But, uh, you know, it created some bad blood uh, there, which, yeah, I mean, I, I put myself in the family's position. I can certainly understand that. And wanting, uh, you know, some accountability, you know, for the farmers, they just, uh, you know, wanted some kindness. Uh, and, and they felt like, you know, they really didn't get that from the scouts. Um, but again, yeah, it's just, you know, it is a, it's a very complicated situation. And um, they come off, Chris, you know, basically looking, you know, kind of heartless. But I mean, you know, knowing people within the organization, you know, I, that I don't think certainly wasn't wasn't the case. But it's, it's a perception that uh, just inevitably, I think, is going to kind of stick to them. Yeah, there was a line in the article, which I, you know, I, I think came from the statement that they they gave, which was about they were trying to protect the the good work that they were doing. And, you know, I mean, it, it really was a no win situation for them. And it's, you know, for them to express uh, any, you know, constellation could, I mean, because this got swept up in, in courts could be used by, you know, the family's attorneys as admissions of guilt or any kind of legal leverage, yeah. which definitely muddies everything. And it's, it's very difficult to have those conversations. I mean, there isn't really any kind of off the record in, in that scenario. No, it's not. I, I think of the, the, you know, camps that I went to, the scout camps or, you know, wherever else. And I don't remember seeing any protections or, you know, big gates. It was a different era. Completely. And, you know, there would be a civil case a few years later. And I mean, ultimately, you know, I think uh, the decision was that the, the Girl Scouts, in particular, this, this Tulsa area or Northeastern Oklahoma area group that what they, you know, had provided there was were consistent with the standards nationally of that era. Certainly you can look back on it. I mean, there, there were some legitimate issues, but you know, it, it was consistent with how other camps, you know, were, were run during that time. And, you know, it's like, we're, you know, similar stories that, too often it takes an event like this to really uh, bring about some kind of change because frankly, you know, up until the event happens, you're not aware that it's necessary. Looking back on it, I mean, yeah, we're a more jaded uh, bunch now. I mean, we know that unfortunately uh, children are, are hurt, abused, even killed, subjected to violence every day in our society. And that was not unprecedented at that time. Certainly those things happen, but it just seems like uh, it's, it's been a growing problem and something that we still can't fully get our arms around. But hindsight, yeah, some things could have been done differently, but uh, you just got to kind of put yourself in the mindset of that era and, and just realize that something like this would have been the furthest thing from anyone's mind. I mean, really, at that time. Yeah. And you mentioned the the civil suits. And also in this article, we actually have, you know, mentioned in the articles about the comparisons to the OJ case, which, I mean, given the media circus and the ultimate acquittal, aren't entirely unfounded. But There's definite parallels, you bet. To kind of extend the the OJ comparison, I know the the Goldmans and the uh, you know won a, a civil case against OJ after the fact, yeah. um, after that initial uh, criminal court case. Was there? And this might just I, you know, I'm kind of ignorant, I guess, on like legal issues. But would it have been possible for the families to have filed a, a civil case against? against heart at all or obviously or is that just kind of dredging things up i, I just i don't know if that's any, any recourse that they explored or if you you know covered that at all yeah uh chris you know i honestly that until you just suggested that had not occurred to me i assume you know since we've seen that in other cases that that that's something that would have been on the table you know obviously he died so soon after the end of the uh, criminal trial, which he was acquitted, 
I don't know that, you know, given that, that that was even time enough to consider that option. I mean, by the time they got around to trying to pursue some kind of legal action, you know, he, he was gone. And so that opportunity was lost. But that, that's something I would uh, I would have to ask, you know, uh, the farmers or Betty Milner. I I just I don't know. That's an it's an interesting question. Um, so, I mean, what the Goldman's got, I think, in the OJ case, I mean, it's not that they got, I mean, there was some kind of a monetary, you know, element to it. I don't remember how much, but they knew they weren't going to get that. And it really wasn't the point of it. They just wanted some kind of accountability, if I recall. The civil case provided them that, provided them what, you know, the criminal um, trial did not. And that's certainly a comparison or perpendicular to this case in that they were unable to get, regardless of how any hypothetical civil suit might have played out, they, they, they didn't get that closure to it. Exactly. Yeah. But it certainly drove the families and, as we find out, other people to end up pursuing a lot of efforts beyond the the courtroom to help other families in similar situations. Yeah, very much so. You know, Sherry Farmer in particular, and also, uh, you know, um, Dick Gousset, both uh, pursued advocacy. You know, how this case affected people, those directly concerned, like the families, and then people who are more peripherally concerned is is really an interesting thing and we we do touch on some of that in this story including uh you know a woman named cheryl stokes who was uh you know a friend of lori farmer and who went on as a result of of you know what happened to lori to pursue a career with uh the national center for missing and exploited children Mm -hmm. Which that's that is so compelling to me that a loss, you know, that she suffered of this friend of hers, you know, ultimately sent her on this route. And and so she spent, you know, the rest of her life and is doing it now, trying to uh, advocate and intervene on behalf of children. You know, that's uh, that's powerful. You said she keeps photos of the three girls. Still does. I mean, to this day. So, you know, just through her and her efforts, good has come out of something so terrible. And you see that over and over again in this and including with the families. And, you know, mentioned Dick Gousset, and I want to say something about him. And, you know, we chose with this story to, to start this off. We wanted, you know, to bring Michelle Uh, Gousset more into this to the extent that we could, as we've discussed previously, um, you know, the Gousset family opted not to participate because they, that's something that uh, I think roughly 20 years ago, they had decided that it just wasn't good for their family to continue to do media interviews and uh, completely get that. And uh, we were thankful I was thankful just to be able to talk to uh, Dick briefly before the project began. And I just, you know, I want to say, you know, Dick Gousset was, he was very blunt. He never minced words. He had what I would interpret over the years as a kind of a love-hate relationship with the media. You know, he told me that the day after the murders, he was at his home and his attorney was there and uh there was a, a knock on the door and um you know as a member of the media and I, and I will say it was not not somebody from tulsa but he said that and these were dick's words that this this person demanded a photo of michelle and he said it was all he could do not to punch this person the extent that his attorney had to hold him back so from the very start you know, he had a, I don't want to say, obviously he had good experiences and he told me that good experience with members of the media as well, but that kind of set a tone, I think. And 
to me, that's unconscionable. Now, granted, it's his perception of, of whatever the exchange was. And another thing he told me that has stayed with me, and I want to tell you about this, he, uh, in opting, you know, not to participate, he did call me back and he did explain to me why. He said, I want you to do one thing for me with this project. Whatever you do, please spell my daughter's name right. Cheryl's name, as you may have noticed, is spelled a little unconventionally for Michelle. It's spelled with one L, not twos. Apparently, and I did see some of this in, in looking back through old articles, you know, but too often in media coverage over the years, it had been spelled with two. I think probably every media organization that covered this case at one time or another, probably at some point, probably misspelled her name. So, and, you know, it's very tempting, you know, to, for a brief moment, think of that as a small thing. I mean, because we're, we're talking about an L, but I just want to say, no, that's not a small thing. It's not to her family or to anyone who knew her. And I remember thinking to myself after I hung up, you know what, if I don't accomplish anything else with this series, I am going to make absolutely sure Michelle's name is spelled correctly every single time. And we did that, but it, I can tell you, I was almost even paranoid about it. Double, triple check in every reference in the stories and, and in photo captions and just everywhere that the name might conceivably appear. So fast forward a bit, a few days after the series had wrapped up, um, this would be a few months after my initial conversation with, with Dick, I received a letter in the mail, handwritten, well, actually it was a typewritten letter, it was a simple blue sheet of paper, yeah, done with a typewriter, and it was from Dick Gousset, and he just wanted me to know that, that he had read every word of the story when it came out. And, and he had a couple of observations. And, and again, Dick is a very blunt man. Yeah, he doesn't mince words. He wanted me to know first and foremost, you know, how hard it was for him to read it. And like it is every time he has to revisit the details of his daughter's case, that is a hard thing. And he wanted me basically to understand the impact of it on him. At the same time, he had some other things to say. He said he wanted to thank me. He said the story was accurate, and he said it was compassionate. But he said, most of all, I want to thank you for spelling my daughter's name right. And I already knew, you know, from my earlier conversation how important that was to him. But the fact that he would write to say that just underscored that for me. And it made me think, Chris, of all the times, you know, he had seen his daughter's name in print over the years in the context of this horrible crime and had to have that additional indignity of seeing her, her name misspelled. And if this project overall was not something that he was comfortable in participating in, I am glad that at least we were able to give him that. And I could tell it meant something. And I just want to say my takeaway as a writer and a journalist is, you know, what might seem like the smallest detail to one person could be the most important one for someone else. And so this that was a good reminder of that for me. And I just wanted to relay that story uh, about Dick. And as I've mentioned, you know, previously, he has since passed away. But, you know, I did have, you know, a couple of exchanges with him and, and they were positive overall. But, you know, just... Uh, I guess you could feel that his grief was still there even after all these years. And um, yes, he, he was able to, to take that and make some good from it, um, you know, in, in his advocacy efforts. And, um, but just wanted to say that since, you know, we weren't able really to bring the Gousses into this and by their own choice, which we certainly respected. But yeah, that, that was, uh, you know, that affected me you know, just uh, to deal with her name. Yeah, I mean, it shows a tremendous amount of respect on on your part and, you know, kind of reveals that all you assume, you'd like to assume that, you know, every other journalist out there covering this stuff is coming with the best of intentions. These small things really do matter, especially in such a 
massive tragedy for a community and for for this you know one family in in specific and the thing about it is chris and i just you know i want to say we've all done it i mean if you if you've been in this business i mean it, it happens and a lot of times it's not you know in a situation like this where you're talking about the name of a of a murder victim it may just be something not nearly you know that grave but yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it's a good reminder. To change gears. You bet. <laughs> just a little bit. Um, one thing that jumped out was Amy Sullivan, who I think you've mentioned in the past. Amy came up in the first story, yes. Who wrote a, a master's thesis on the, the civil case that was brought against the Girl Scouts. How did you come into contact with her and what were some of the, the details of, of her story that were the most interesting to you? Sure. Yeah. I, you know, Amy was uh, very gracious to accommodate us. And I think she, uh, there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of Girl Scouts at that camp, you know, that, that weekend for that session. I knew going in that if we could find at least one, because obviously you may find some, not all people are going to be comfortable talking about this. I think I was put in touch with Amy. I think it was through Michelle Hoffman, you know, who also features prominently in this series, particularly in the first story. And then I think in the one coming up, Amy was able, you know, what I loved about what she was able to provide, her being able to uh, put us in the camp that night, in fact, in, in a tent, as one of the scouts and you know what that experience was like um i think was invaluable uh to that first story and helping um, give us a sense of setting you know if you recall not to rehash too much but you know she uh you know, when she was reunited with her parents she was writing i guess in her journal that night and just to show you how how young these kids were I mean, she wasn't even really clear on what the word murder meant and, you know, was initiated through this terrible experience into a, a you know, a more adult understanding of, of the world, a loss of innocence, so to speak. I remember that being a, a detail, a very vivid detail that, you know, really helped fit in with that first story. But, you know, in talking to her about that, you know, she was also able to um, talk about you know, this thesis and, uh, you know, her, her direction in life since that time and found her to be, you know, a great asset uh, to this series. And some of the stuff that she mentioned in there uh, that we have alluded to or referenced in previous conversations were some of the, the quote unquote thefts and, and strange happenings that, that happened around the, the case. And I know that we'll, I mean, we'll link to the additional article that you guys have um, about a, a specific pastry, but I didn't know if you wanted to kind of go into more detail about any of that, the thefts and, and strange happenings. We talked briefly about this and it is, I think in, it's on our, you know, on our website where we've collected all the items from this project. Yeah, that's, that is a reference to the, uh, I guess, sort of infamous kill note. And, um, no, we haven't. We we haven't talked about that. It is. Uh, it has kind of become, you know, part of the folklore of this story. That a lot of people who talk about the story will say or ask me about it, or somebody, or they'll say, "Now, wasn't there a note of some kind uh, involved with this? You know, where you know the killer predicted what he was going to do, but they they don't know the specific details." You know, we were able to find out more. And it was principally through uh, Michelle Hoffman, who was uh, who we just mentioned, but she was the one who found the note. I can give you the basics, but again, if you want to read a few more details, that's on our on our website. But the deal with the note was, you know, this was a few weeks, you know, before this particular summer session of, of camp at which you know the murders would happen. I think uh, a lot of the girls. Uh, uh, the older girls were there preparing for the upcoming summer. And Michelle, being a counselor in training, um, was there. And they were staying in some of the tents. 
And um, as she described it, they had gone to some activity. Um, and when she and her tent mates, you know, came back to their tent, they were surprised, shocked to see that the tent essentially had been ransacked. Items tossed around, looked like somebody had gone through their things. She had actually brought a, a box of donuts uh, to, to share. And presumably whoever had ransacked the tent had eaten these donuts and uh, left the box behind. Well, in looking at the box more closely, uh, Michelle discovered that uh, there were several pieces of paper, small, I think probably torn to a small uh, pocket-sized spiral notebook. Um, she looked at them more closely and they had writing on them. A lot of it was gibberish, but um, at least one part that was, was legible said was, we are on a mission to kill three Girl Scouts. And I mean, that's eerie, no doubt about it. I mean, you know, what are the odds, you know, that uh, someone would just randomly leave a note like that and then, you know, a few weeks later, something very much like what the note was describing, you know, would occur. Either the note was left there, you know, by the person who did this crime, person or persons, or it was just, you know, a prank um, or a hoax. And, um, the note itself, you know, would subsequently disappear. Michelle turned the note in to the camp director and, uh, you know, we said she would look into it. And uh, as Michelle found out later, some other girls actually had confessed um, to doing this. Michelle was never quite satisfied with that explanation. And, um, you know, I can understand why. Unfortunately, uh, no one was ever able to inspect the note itself, um, including the authorities who would be later investigating the murders, uh, because, uh, you know, I guess the director had, uh, thinking that uh, the issue had been resolved, disposed of the note. And so the note, you know, has never been seen again. Michelle saw it that one time, and it's kind of burned into her brain. She can, uh, you know, recall it in, in very minute detail. You know, her take on it is that it's just a very strange thing and she can't say what it means one way or the other. But she she did say that the paper that it, it was written on looked like it had been, it didn't look like it had just been cleanly torn out of a notebook. It looked like it had been carried around possibly in someone's pocket. That to her I mean, is a little more troubling aspect. It doesn't seem quite like it would fit with, you know, some other girls at the camp you know, just taking a notebook and, you know, writing that note out. There are a couple of problems maybe with linking this to what happened later. You know, the note does specifically mention that three Girl Scouts would be killed. And that is exactly what did happen. It's hard to fathom, though, because the, the way the campsite were, each one of these tents were four-person tents. And the fact that there were only three people in you know, the victim's tent that first night was actually a mistake. They were going to, they were supposed to have four and that fourth person would have been added the next day, but they just left it as it was for that one night. But to anyone, to any outside observer or someone who may have been watching the camp, they would have been aware that they, these were four person tents. Why would they specifically say, I, we're going to on a mission to kill three Girl Scouts, how would they know, how would they have prior knowledge that there would actually be a situation that there would be a tent where there were only three girls in it that night? It's hard to know what to make of that, but you can see why. And this note, this note would not come up in the, in the criminal trial. It would come up in the civil case. Michelle gave a deposition and it was, I think, part of the, uh, you know, the family's attempts to show that camp officials should have been more vigilant. There was some kind of negligence at play. Yeah, I mean, I can see why they would have used that. But it's just, you know, that's that's remained just a very cryptic part of this case, especially since the note no longer exists and it couldn't be forensically evaluated. It's just another aspect of it where there's there's no closure. It's maddening. Yeah, there's because you don't know, and all all we've got is really is Michelle's memory of it, and you know what was entered into the record regarding it at you know at the civil trial. But 
yeah, hard to know what to think about that. I mean, uh, yeah, it could just be a coincidence, but wow, what a coincidence, right? I mean, you name three scouts. I mean, it's eerie. Yeah, and then just a few weeks later, what what do you have? Three dead Girl Scouts. You also mentioned uh, Ross Swimmer in this article, who was head of the the Cherokee. Cherokee principal chief, yes, at the time, yes. One of the things that he mentioned was speculation about evidence planting or rumors that would lead people to, you know, support Hart. And and I didn't know what the the evidence planted was. I I can't remember if that came up in any of the previous articles. I think it's gone into more detail in maybe one of the sidebars. Uh, and it's you know it's something that you know when when we do our wrap up episode and you know we kind of talk about what specifically you know made up this circumstantial case against Hart and where where that's gone from from then I. The basically two ways you can read this is um, Gene Hart either did this crime or was involved in it, or the other alternative, and I really think there are only two, is that he was framed for it. And yeah, as far as the evidence planting from the beginning, you know that there was a you know belief by some that some of the evidence was um, in fact fabricated and and I think what they're referring to is specifically some items that were found in the cabin where he was ultimately captured uh they found uh some some items there that um some of the counselors in the Girl Scout camp would ultimately identify and uh claim that had been stolen from them the cabin, you know, had been processed, you know, by OSBI agents, Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. You know, I don't know what the basis really is for claiming that, you know, that evidence was planted there. I do know, I think that uh, the OSBI agents who found these items, I don't think they found them on the first visit to the cabin after he was captured. It was on a, it was later when they were processing the scene again. They said that you know, they wouldn't, I mean, there were a lot of things in this cabin, a lot of items, and nothing would have necessarily stood out. You know, that's always been, you know, at the heart of theory that there was a conspiracy here, is that the evidence used against Hart, um, the items that, you know, presumably would have put him at the crime scene just within hours of the crime, because, you know, the counselors only ar- arrived at this. Um, the camp the previous day. So opportunity to actually steal some items from them was limited. It would have had to have been, uh, you know, Saturday or, you know, the Sunday of of the crimes. You know, people who um, believed Hart was innocent and still do, um, really that's their, that's what they hang their hat on is that, uh, that he was number one, an easy target and you know had been targeted previously by law enforcement he was kind of the the go-to guy if anything went wrong oh where's gene hart let's go bring him in the evidence planting is something that people who believe gene hart still you know hang on to as as their defense but one of the things you talk about in this article is the the dna testing yes which however incomplete it might be certainly narrows that target range. In uh, 1989, um, DNA technology was still very, very new at the time. Um, There was test at that time that yielded a partial DNA profile. And that partial profile did, you know, as far as it went, match Gene Hart. Now, because it was not a full profile, you know, ultimately authorities call that inconclusive. What they did say, again, I know this is in the story, but, I, uh, you know, only one out of 7,700 some odd Native American males would match that partial profile. And, you know, Hart did match it. The prosecutor 
Mays County prosecutor at the time of this test result, he, he said that, you know, if he'd had that in 1978, he would have used that in the trial. I mean, it's another circumstantial piece, but it's a big one, and it would have bolstered what they already had. Again, there have been a number of tests over the years of DNA. Um, the most recent one, and we reference it in the article, was um, about the time when our original series came out, I think. And this was a round of testing that was unique in that it was paid for through private donations from Mays County residents. And I'm sorry to say, you know, that did not yield any results. But one thing that I think it's important to underscore is that, you know, this was people from Mays County, um, just regular citizens who who put their money into this to get this done. And, you know, they've residents there have caught flack over the years, unfairly, I think, for how, uh, you know, the, with the trial situation back in the late 70s, you know, and how that went down. And, you know, they've been thought of as a bunch of homers who you know, were protecting the hometown boy. But, I mean, let's I mean, look at this. I mean, regardless of how they feel or who they think did this, they, they are invested, it seems to me, in seeing justice done in this case. I think the fact that they did this, you know, and reached into their own pockets, you know, demonstrates that. It just, unfortunately, uh, you know, this time didn't bring any answers. One of the things, Chris, that, you know, people often bring up now is they, they ask about genetic genealogy in this case. That is, you know, a, a relatively new thing that has been making a lot of headlines here the last couple of years, particularly at, uh, it was the route that finally helped solve the Golden State Killer case. The problem here is, again, before we can do that, we have to find, still have to find a test sample that's in good enough condition, you know, that has not degraded too much to produce that, that full DNA profile, that complete genetic fingerprint of the offender. And until you have that, genetic genealogy is not an option. I mean, neither is, you know, if they had that full profile, it, it would do, it would either match hearts or it would not. And if it did not, you know, they'd, they'd plug that into, first of all, I think that the National DNA Database, CODIS, and try to find a match. And then after that, if that didn't result, you might go the genetic genealogy route. But all of that is not even on the table, you know, until you have a full profile. You mentioned the, the Golden State Killer. I mean, that's one where they had multiple crime scenes for them to get that biological evidence from. Yeah, I mean, that's that's very true. Countless crime scenes. So, uh, you know, that would be, um, you know, a big advantage. And that's one that, that you don't have here. They play this pretty close to their vest. I mean, they don't talk very much about what they've got. But I think it is fair to say that if, if there's any biological evidence, it's not much. And, and there may not be any left. But the reality is this. And they started some of this with this last round. You know, with advances in technology, especially in what's called touch DNA, which is where anytime, you know, a human being touches something with his skin, he leaves skin cells behind. It's inevitable. And so it is potentially possible to extract DNA from, you know, skin cells that have been left behind. With any future testing in this case, that's where you could ultimately see a result. The opportunities for collecting potential touch DNA. I mean, you've got sleeping bags, you've got the clothing from the victims. I mean, this thing's almost unthinkable that, you know, the offender would not have left skin cells behind somewhere. So potentially, you know, going forward, you could test every square inch of those, you know, those items to try to find touch DNA. So the technology at this point is, is not the issue. Um, the obstacle, I think, going forward is, and like it is for a lot of cold cases around the country, the obstacle is funding because, you know, testing is expensive. You know, frankly, you know, state resources are limited and they often, in fact, they have to be dedicated to more current cases. Raising the money privately and then pursuing results through a private lab, I suspect that, you know, that's, how this one could ultimately be resolved, 
you know, what happened, you know, with the Mays County testing and how they uh, came together to do that. That's, a, I think, is a valuable uh, model, you know, going forward, not just for this case, but for others. That's why I would never say never. I think at this point, getting an answer through the biological evidence, yeah, I think, you know, given what we've seen over with the results in the past, they're just too degraded. I mean, maybe uh, who knows how it was collected, how properly that was done. I mean, this was, you know, 77 techniques are, were not then what they are now. And how it was stored uh, initially, I mean, that could also be an issue. It's hard to say, you know, why why the DNA has not, you know, been produced in this case. But it's frustrating, but I think we could definitely say there's still hope because the technology has come a long way in a very short period of time. Hope is a good sentiment to close on. Hope for closure, hope for resolutions for these these families that that have been so so devastated by this and closure for uh, a community which is what we're going to get into next week with the uh the next chapter is still feeling the impact yeah well thank you for tuning in to late edition crime beat chronicles there's a lot more where that came from just over the horizon so make sure that you're subscribed to the show wherever you listen to your podcasts. As I said earlier, there are a ton of incredible additional resources that you can explore on the Tulsa World site, which I'll have links to in the show notes. The show was produced, recorded, and edited by me, Chris Lay, with tremendous thanks to Tim Stanley and the rest of the team at the Tulsa World for the work they put in reporting the series in 2017. For Lee Enterprises, I'm Chris Lay.